Hi, welcome to this physionic detailed study analysis. In this analysis, we're going to be going over six studies to come to a conclusion on oxidized LDL and the potential risk that it has on heart disease. So we're going to go over mechanisms and then we're going to go over a whole load of different data points and then we're going to ultimately eventually come to a conclusion. Now, if you'd like to just skip to that conclusion and skip out on all the details and skip out on all the context and whatnot, uh, certainly you're gonna miss some potentially important information, but for the highlights, you can just skip to the conclusions and takeaways section of this video. Now, for everybody else that's gonna be going forward with me through this adventure, trying to tease out information, tease out conclusions from uh, a body of data, then uh, welcome. And if you're not familiar with who I am, my name is Nicholas Verhoeven. I'm a PhD candidate in molecular medicine, and I hold my master's in exercise physiology. I've been a cell biology researcher for a number of years, and this is what I do. So I break down studies. I group together studies, I analyze the studies, then I, uh, in an open format, then break it down for you, uh, including the physiological mechanisms of what the studies actually end up showing. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into this. All right, so the topics that we're going to be covering are uh, obviously oxidized LDL mechanisms of action. So these are the proposed mechanisms of action. I'm going to go through uh, a bunch of figures and drawings that I've essentially made for this presentation. Then we're going to go over the relationship that oxidized LDL has to heart disease. So we're going to see if there is a relationship, so to corroborate the mechanisms of action. And then we're going to go over uh, vitamin E supplementation in lowering oxidized LDL, uh, if that has an effect on lowering LDL and if that effect actually ultimately leads to potentially reduced heart disease if there is that relationship between oxidized LDL and heart disease. Now for my insiders, if you're part of my Physionic Insiders program, you also get access to a number of different other molecules that uh, lower oxidized LDL based off of the studies that I analyzed, as well as a better target, a potential better target than oxidized LDL for uh, atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease risk. If you want access to the full version of this video that you're watching right now, so that includes the insiders uh, sections as well, then join my insiders program, which you can find, uh, there's links all over the place. I'll have one pop up on screen, but also uh, down in the description box as well. Okay, but if you're just interested in these three topics, let's go ahead and uh, move forward. All right, so as I mentioned, we're going to be going over the mechanisms of action, and that comes from these two scientific reviews. Now, as usual, uh, I have uh, the number for the study. So this is study 188 and 189. You can find the reference numbers and whatnot uh, in the notes that I'll be supplying with this video. And in terms of the funding, they were both publicly funded, so you can check out the funding source as well by going over to the notes. All right, so let's start to break this down in terms of let's let's go from a kind of high level and then let's go, you know, deeper and deeper into the details as as I like to do when it comes to physionic. So let's start out with a human being here. So we've got uh, a person and you can see that their vasculature is is very well presented. So it's you can see all the details of their vasculature including their arteries, including their their veins. And if we were to zoom in to just a single piece of that vasculature, a single piece of the blood vessel, then this is what we'd find in a cross section of the blood vessel. So if we were to cut the blood vessel in half and just look at that half, then this is what we would find inside. So we'd find, you know, red blood cells, we'd find electrolytes, we'd find proteins, we'd find all kinds of different things. I didn't feel like illustrating every single thing that we would find in there. But for the most part, the point is that we would find a whole host of different molecules that would be in the bloodstream just moving along. And then if we were to zoom in even further and look at the lining, so the actual, the, the first barrier that makes up that, that blood vessel on the side that the liquid is actually touching, uh, which is called the lumen, we see uh, this structure right here. So here we are, we're zooming in, 
and we're seeing the red blood cells here and this is the lumen so this is the, uh, what we're seeing right here in a kind of a bigger view but here we're zooming it in and we see that there are cells that line the the lumen so they they touch the lumen they touch the liquid and that liquid touches cells known as endothelial cells now these endothelial cells have a number of different functions but one of the main functions is to control these bottom cells right here these smooth muscle cells so you are probably aware of muscle cells as like skeletal muscle cells so like on your arms and your legs uh, your back your chest i mean all the the actual movement muscle cells and then we also have cardiac muscle cells but we also have smooth muscle cells which are found in our intestines but as well are also found across our vasculature especially our arteries and these smooth muscle cells are the ones that actually dictate the size of the the vessel so the blood vessel so they can either shrink the blood vessel by squeezing together to essentially contracting and squeezing together to to make the lumen this open space uh, a smaller which obviously increases blood pressure in that region or they can relax and when they relax then the lumen opens and then you get a reduction in blood pressure in that region so this is focal occurrences so this is focal blood pressure that's changing now the control of these smooth muscle cells one of the main controls is these other cells which we can deem them like controller cells in that they secrete different molecules that then ultimately affect the smooth muscle cells and so that's one of the functions of the endothelial cells we're not as interested in the common or colloquial functions of endothelial cells but just as, a, as an anchor of why they're there, that's why they're there. Now, under the endothelial cells, once you get into a region called the intima, uh, because we have different subsections, and I'm not even showing all of them, I'm just showing uh, the, the most pertinent ones to this discussion, but as we get under the endothelial layer, we get into the intima layer, and that's where we start to encounter uh, different proteins that make up the matrix or make up the structure around or below the endothelial cell. So let's say that's this, uh, this kind of yellowish structure here and in this image. But if we were to zoom in, the colors don't really matter, but if we were to zoom in, we would see that there are these structural proteins that are uh, really like an architecture that goes across and they separate and create the structure that allows for this blood vessel to maintain its round shape, its uh, cylindrical shape, and allows it to be able to resist blood pressure changes. Now, this structure is made up of a number of different proteins, but one of them is proteoglycans. Uh, another one, for example, might be collagen, but we're gonna be focused on the proteoglycans. So the proteoglycans have these, this structure of protein plus uh, saccharides or carbohydrates that are stitched together to essentially create this architecture. And then below that, then we have the smooth muscle cells. And as I already explained what the smooth muscle cells do, they do a number of things, but one of the, the chief reasons that they exist is for the squeezing and relaxation of the blood vessel. So that is the general architecture of uh, the, the blood vessels of the arteries specifically, but of all blood vessels as a whole. Now, that's just the base and there's certainly a lot more intricacy than what I'm showing here, but I'm trying to hone the eye to just focus on certain aspects. So just full disclosure, this is not all the information that you would need to know to have a cardiovascular, uh, an educate, a full education on cardiovascular physiology. Okay, so one of the, the chief concerns or the mechanisms that's been proposed is that in our lumen, so along the, the blood flow, we have the introduction of lipoproteins. Now these lipoproteins, as many people have, I'm sure you're well aware that these lipoproteins actually serve a function and they deliver a number of different uh, nutrients or molecules to the variety of the millions and millions of cells that make up our body. And these lipoproteins make up, they add triglycerides and cholesterol esters. So uh, cholesterol molecules as opposed to cholesterol lipoproteins. So the lipoprotein itself is partly made up of cholesterol and it's made up of phospholipids and things of that nature. But the inside core, the actual inside, the, the, the 
packaging unit inside that actually houses everything that it needs to transport is cholesterol esters and triglycerides primarily. So these serve a function and they are necessary to life. They, they, they must exist. So they're found in the bloodstream. So they follow along with red blood cells that we can see here and certainly electrolytes and proteins and whatnot, like I mentioned earlier. However, these lipoproteins can also move or what's known as transcytose to the proteoglycan layer. And the reason why they do that, and I've explained this in other content before, but just in brief, uh, the reason why they do that is because they have a negative charge. So this, you see this orange structure here, that's uh, called an ApoB protein. So the ApoB protein is found on a number of different lipoproteins, but one of the chief ones, or probably the chief one, is low density lipoproteins or LDL uh, lipoproteins. And, or I suppose it's a repetition, LDL, so LD lipoproteins, so LDL molecules or particles. And this ApoB has a negative charge to it. So if we were to get into chemistry a little bit, so the negative and positive attract to one another, and the lipoprotein has this negative charge due to this ApoB. And beyond that, the proteoglycans have a positive charge. So they end up attracting the lipoproteins from the lumen past the endothelial layer and then attach to the proteoglycans. Now, if you have a certain level, a very low level of lipoproteins in the bloodstream, then there's actually a dissociation that can occur as well. So that dissociation means that these lipoproteins can then free themselves from the proteoglycans and then can re-enter into circulation and disappear and go off and fulfill their function. However, when there are really high levels of these lipoproteins, we have mass attraction of many lipoproteins to proteoglycans. And while the dissociation occurs at a particular speed, a particular a rapidity, the, as, the association, so the, the movement of these lipoproteins to the proteoglycans can be really high. So it's an overwhelming amount of association and a, a while a standard but very low level of dissociation. So you tend to build up these lipoproteins across the way. Now that can occur through a number of different mechanisms according to these, uh, to these scientific reviews. One of them is that they can move passage through the endothelial, or past, I should say, past the endothelial cells through these gaps. So that's one way they can directly go to the proteoglycans. The other way is actually through the lipoproteins interacting and being sucked up or being uh, taken up by the endothelial cells. So we've got particular receptors that allow us to bind to uh, these lipoproteins. And then once they get taken up by the endothelial cells, then they're ejected then on the other end. So there, you can think of it like there's two different uh, ends to the cell. You've got the top end and which, which is, uh, I believe that's called the apical membrane. And the other membrane on the bottom here is called the basolateral membrane. So it essentially gets taken up by the apical membrane up here, and then it gets ejected out of the basolateral membrane and can then end up binding to the proteoglycans. Okay, so that's not actually discussing oxidation, however, although oxidation can occur uh, while the lipoproteins are floating around through a number of mechanisms that I'll, I'll describe in just a little bit. But beyond that, once they've bound to the proteoglycans, they're also sus susceptible to uh, oxidation. So oxidation meaning that you have some sort of structural damage to the lipoproteins and they can be oxidized in many different uh, ways it's not just one way that they're oxidized or one particular aspect of this structure that allow that can be oxidized there are many aspects of this structure that can uh, be oxidized so how are they oxidized? Well, they're oxidized uh, primarily through reactive oxygen species. So that's oxidative stress. So these unsatisfied, the way I usually describe it on Physionic is that you have these unsatisfied molecules, which they're not, uh, they're not emotional or anything. They just, uh, they have a, a chemical dissatisfaction about them. So they are very unstable. And as a result, they then grab onto other molecules and rip uh, the constituent parts of those molecules apart. So they take uh, 
parts of fully functional molecules and rip those parts off to essentially satisfy themselves. So they're very toxic relationship if you want to look at it that way. But uh, in reality, they're not thinking about it. This is just a, these are just things that are happening, happening chemically, molecularly. So what they're ripping away from these uh, other factors, other, other proteins, other lipids, other carbohydrate, all that stuff is uh, electrons. So they're taking electrons to satisfy themselves, but that ultimately ends up damaging all the other uh, proteins and lipids and whatnot that actually end up getting oxidized. So that's what's happening here. So if reactive oxygen species molecules end up interacting with a fully functioning, perfectly healthy, or I should say, well, yeah, let's call it a healthy, a normal uh, functioning, normally structured lipoprotein, then it leads to damage to that lipoprotein. So one of the regions of reactive oxygen species generation can be from the endothelial cells and your body, your, every single one of your cells, or I suppose I should say most of your cells, are, are producing some level of reactive oxygen species. So the reason why it happens in general, if, even if you're the most perfectly healthy individual on planet Earth, you're number one, you're still going to be producing some reactive oxygen species. So you get some baseline level of reactive oxygen species production and some level of oxidation. Now that may not be a problem because then you can end up uh, ameliorating that or getting rid of it somehow, but it's always going to be present. We can't stop ourselves from producing uh, ROS, reactive oxygen species. And we wouldn't want to because ROS, even though they're considered very scary and they can damage and whatnot, they actually also serve a purpose. They can be uh, influenced or, or have an influence in uh, cell signaling as well. But that's a story for another time. The point is that uh, these lipoproteins get oxidized or damaged by reactive oxygen species or oxidative stress molecules in general, and ultimately lead to the oxidation of the lipoproteins. So some of the sources of this reactive oxygen species actually come from uh, oxidase enzymes. So we're talking about enzymes like NADPH, oxidase, lipoxygenase, uh, what else? Xanthine oxidase and peroxidases. So the point is that there are a bunch of oxidase enzymes that are specifically there to oxidize. And they ultimately produce molecules that can then enact this damage that I've been talking about. And these can come from not just the endothelial cells, they can actually also come from the smooth muscle cells. And adventurers say they probably come from the immune cells as well. But in the, in the very beginning, it starts off with smooth muscle cells and uh, the endothelial cells. Now, another aspect is just the fact that these lipoproteins are taken up by the endothelial cells through this transcytosis uh, mechanism that I was talking about that can also trigger changes in the endothelial cells that are less than desirable. So they can actually lead to greater expression of these genes, the genes that are responsible for the production of these oxidase enzymes, which then leads to more of these harmful molecules, potentially harmful molecules to be produced, which then leads to further oxidation. So oxidation can occur before, but it can also happen while the, the lipoproteins are bound to the proteoglycans. Now, there's also uh, spontaneous levels of uh, oxidation. So there's a number of different factors. So they're like hyperlipidemia. So if you're talking about uh, high glucose, high lipoproteins, high triglycerides, those can all have an effect, uh, mainly because you're, increase, you're typically increasing the number of lipoproteins. And if you have a baseline level of reactive oxygen species production, you have a certain level of oxidative stress. If you have more of the supply, essentially, then you're going to be able to produce a lot more of these oxidative or oxidated uh, lipoproteins. So higher levels of and there is a relationship between triglycerides and lipoproteins, for example, but certainly other factors as well. So if you have a glycation of some of these proteins, then that can increase the susceptibility of these lipoproteins to being oxidized further. So those are, I, I would consider those non-spontaneous or at least partially non-spontaneous mechanisms by which we, we increase the susceptibility of lipoproteins to be oxidized. However, there are also spontaneous mechanisms by which like irradiation, for example, so looking at that, so 
Uh, that can be anything. So if you're talking about like a nuclear power plant, if you're talking about sun damage, any sort of irradiation that can lead to damaging of the lipoproteins, as well as pollutants so or uh, particulates that get released or that we end up consuming like smoking particulates. They can bind to lipoproteins, but they can also have a direct effect on the endothelial cells and probably the smooth muscle cells, really every cell in our body, and can ultimately change the way that these cells react to a higher than normal level of these lipoproteins, which can have lead to like an overreaction and can may possibly also just directly affect these cells so that they produce more reactive oxygen species in their own right. So that, those are the first initial steps, essentially, that you have the binding, then you, you can have the possible oxidation. And then you have the, eventually, as you get more of this oxidation, that actually can lead endothelial cells to do a number of things. So one of them is to start secreting what are known as uh, cytokines. And these cytokines can come in the form of what's known as chemoattractants. So those are big words, but uh, in reality, it's just molecules that are more specific to immune cells. So these immune cells then get essentially recruited. They get called. Like think about uh, the endothelial cells like using a, a megaphone to, that, that can only can be heard by the immune cells. So a great example of this, I believe there's like a particular frequency that dogs can only hear. So if you use a, a whistle, then only the dogs can hear it think of that almost. So there's this whistle that gets, uh, that gets blown and the immune cells then come a calling. They, they come by. So that's what we see. So we see monocytes, but this isn't just re, uh, limited to monocytes. It can also occur to, to cells in the adaptive immune system as well, like T cells. But let's focus on the monocyte. So the monocyte here gets uh, closer and then it will actually, it's a really cool mechanism, but they, they essentially have you ever seen uh, videos of pandas? Pandas are incredibly clumsy, and that's kind of what the, the immune cells a little bit look like. I know that's a weird analogy, but uh, they will come in and tumble their way across the endothelial layer. So they'll tumble across. Let me go back here. They'll come in here and just tumble across these endothelial cells until they catch. And when they catch, on uh, on top of one of these endothelial cells, then they can start to stretch out. Such a cool, cool mechanism, so cool to see. And the reason why they do that and why they're able to do that is because of leukocyte adhesion molecules. So these particular receptors like uh, E-cadherins, for example, are particular proteins that allow for the binding to these immune cells. And these immune cells then are able to catch and, and stop themselves from floating on down uh, the bloodstream. And then from there, and we can see an image of, here of the chemokines that I was talking about. So the, it's attracting all these immune cells. But what from there, you have the immune cells that can then uh, also transcytose and move through the endothelial layer and can end up on this bottom layer near the, the proteoglycans. So why is that an issue? Well, the reason why that's an issue is because these cells, these uh, immune cells, one, they may switch from monocytes to macrophages, which means that they're uh, more permanent residents of that general region. And they can then take up, and they typically do end up taking up these oxidized LDL. So they end up attaching to them through a number of receptors, but uh, one of them, one of the main ones is this specific receptor that gets expressed. It's usually expressed in very low levels. And then it gets expressed in much higher levels once these cells end up engaging and recognizing these uh, oxidized LDL. So the oxidized LDL gets recognized and then the expression level of this receptor called LOX, so L-O-X, will then increase substantially so they start producing a lot more of this receptor. This receptor then allows them to bind far more of these oxidized LDL and to essentially take them up within the cell. Now, that may not seem like that big a deal, but the problem is that eventually they take up so much that the insides of these oxidized LDL are filled with uh, cholesterol esters, the molecules of cholesterol, these, these cholesterol uh, aggregates. And well, yes, aggregates, but that isn't 
actually necessarily limited to just the immune cells. This can also happen to the smooth muscle cells as just one example. So it's not just immune cells that end up go undergoing this process, but ultimately because they take up so much of this cholesterol, it leads to dysfunction of the immune cells and it can ultimately lead to necrosis and general cell death of the immune cells, which then leads to a greater immune response as more of these immune cells need to be recruited to then take care of the ones that were just destroyed, that were killed, because the contents therein end up spilling out. So then you have these cholesterol crystals, these aggregates, these crystals that are these bunches of cholesterol molecules that then need to be dealt with. So that leads to some serious issues because then you start to have the buildup of this plaque from these cholesterol crystals and the fats that are found within these lipoproteins. Remember, if we're actually causing oxidation to these lipoproteins, we're compromising the structure of the lipoprotein. So it is also possible for these lipoproteins to leak or release some of these uh, cholesterol esters and these crystals again, the, the, the aggregates of cholesterol together. And that ultimately leads to a much stronger response. So you have this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy as more immune cells are coming into the region and ultimately leading to more of these lipoproteins than doing damage to those immune cells. But that isn't to say that this whole process is only mediated by immune cells. It can also be mediated by smooth muscle cells. Now, there are a number of other changes that occur. I'm not going to go into them at this point. I'm just going to stop it here because this is the, these are the main mechanisms by which oxidized LDL, and there's certainly more, but the main mechanisms are detailed here, that oxidized LDL can have this effect. And ultimately, you, you start to see changes in the other, the other cells, like endothelial cells and smooth muscle cells, will then shift from becoming, from being smooth muscle cells and will essentially deprogram themselves genetically so that they can reprogram themselves to be able to move to different areas of the body. So they essentially try to block off this plaque formation. And that's, that's starting to get into the advanced atherosclerosis, but we won't be touching on that. But I still wanted to, to show you an image of what that looks like as you get this buildup of this cholesterol and these fatty deposits and these foam cells from the, uh, the immune cells that are taken, have taken up so much of these uh, cholesterol particles and uh, yeah, cholesterol particles and the molecules themselves. So those are the mechanisms. However, now we actually need to see if there really is a relationship between oxidized LDL with heart disease. So are these researchers that I got all this information from, are they full of it? Or does the data actually show that this is truly, that there really is a relationship with oxidized LDL? So for that, we're gonna be looking at, we're gonna be starting out with, by looking at study uh, 185. Now. Just of note here, uh, this is a meta-analysis, so that's really fantastic. But uh, the drawback of this is that it's only an observational study. So there are no randomized controlled trials included in this meta-analysis. So that certainly reduces the, the quality of the meta-analysis. Granted, for this kind of stuff, you kind of have to use observational studies because many of these factors like oxidized LDL and LDL and ApoB and all that stuff need to be measured over many decades as opposed to being measured over a few weeks or a few months or even a year. So that's why uh, they had to focus on observational studies. So let's look at this. How do we read this? They've got uh, a number of different studies listed here. So these are all the studies that they've included in the analysis. And We've got the effect size here, which is the amount of difference that they noted. We've got the weight of each study, so how much impact does each study have on the overall analysis. And then we've got the number of events uh, divided by the total. So that's the number of cardiovascular events that have occurred divided by the total number of people or participants that were involved. And what we see is anything to the left would be an indication of oxidized LDL not being a risk factor. And anything moving to the right would mean that there is an increased risk factor from oxidized LDL. So we can see across all these studies, so how we read this is the one indicates that there's no difference. So there's no uh, reduced risk or increased risk with uh, oxidized LDL. And all of these studies 
the the data from all these studies is aggregated and put together and averaged into this one main effects diamond. So the overall effect is this. And we can see that it's moved, shifted quite significantly away from the one. But while visually that may look the case, look at, look as if that's the case, we also need to consider other uh, considerations. So for example, we have to look at the effect size. So how much is the effect size really that great? And is it statistically significant? So they don't actually show the statistical significance here, but the, the reality is that it was. So yes, it is statistically significant. And the effect size was about uh, 0.79 over the, the average or the neutral point of one. So that means a 79% a increase uh, risk of uh, cardiovascular events. So this would indicate that yes, there is an effect of oxidized LDL. If we just look at oxidized LDL's relationship to heart disease or cardiovascular events. Now, one more thing to point out here is the I squared. This is uh, the Higgins I. So this is a measure of heterogeneity. So how much did these uh, studies essentially disagree with one another or how much did they vary from one another? And the value is 21.2%. So that's very low. Uh, and the statistical significance for heterogeneity was non-significant. So this would all indicate that oxidized LDL does have a relationship with uh, heart disease. All right, so this is from the same analysis, and all they did was start breaking things up uh, according to essentially a number of different categories that they wanted to look at independently. So all the studies, they had 12 studies uh, in total, and then they've got their measure of heterogeneity over here. I'm not gonna focus so much on this. I am gonna focus a lot on the effect size over here. So again, remember any number above one would be an indication of, you start to get that indication of increased risk. Anything below one would be reduced risk. And anything like right around one would indicate that there is uh, no increased risk. So when they look at study quality, they've got, uh, there was this other uh, form that they showed like the different stratification of study quality. Some of them they indicated were high quality. Some of them indicated that they were low quality. So they ended up wanting to do a subgroup analysis. And that's what we're looking at here. This is all subgroup analyses that are based off of, for example, these different, uh, these different qualifications. I think that's a good way to put it. So all the studies together, the effect was 1.79. If we go back here, that's 1.79 right here. So that's what we're looking at. This, then when they break it up by study quality, so the ones that they deemed a high quality study, the effect was 1.68. So it may be decreased a little bit. When you look at it with the just looking at the low quality studies, the effects increases substantially. So if you remove those two studies, then the effect is still there but some of the effect was driven by this really strong effect by these two studies. Uh, then when they look at study design, so remember these are all associative studies, so we're not looking at randomized control uh, studies. They've got a, a mixture of different associative studies, so four studies of case, case cohort, community-based cohort, three studies, hospital-based cohort, five. All of them show an effect, that all of them show this increased risk. Um, when they change the definition of what's considered uh, cardiovascular disease, if it's a coronary, di coronary disease or if it's coronary disease and stroke, uh, again, they break it up. Again, there's still an increased risk. When they look at the different types of effect size, we're getting really granular now into statistics here. So you can look at like the relative risk or the hazard ratio. And again, the, the effect is the same. There's, there's no differences. And even if you were to extend here, I, granted it's only two studies, but let's say, let's look at the, the nine studies here. The heterogeneity is 5%. It's so, so low. Then there are different measures, different types of measures for oxidative LDL. And they just want to know, well, maybe it depends on the type of assay, the type of measurement technique that the, the researchers used across these studies. And the most popular one was this uh, 4E6. I think these are antibodies for specific uh, oxidized LDL. And nine studies used this method. And again, across all me measures, uh, it was there was an increased risk. Now there's only one study that used this DLH3, which showed a really high risk, but again, that's only one study.
Then what's really important, this is the most important to me, and that's when they look at the LDLC. So when they're trying to adjust for the, not just look at just does oxidized LDL have an effect, but when they actually looked at LDLC, so that's looking at the total LDL cholesterol content in the body, when they adjust for that, uh, and they take that out of the equation, do they still see an effect of oxidized LDL having a detrimental cardiovascular disease risk? And this is a very important adjustment because if you're just looking at oxidized LDL, it's possible that really in reality, you're just seeing increased levels of overall lipoproteins. And that may be the reason why you have this effect and not because of the oxidized LDL. So that would be, so they're adjusting for what's known as a covariate. And what they found is no matter the, the association, so if they, if they adjust for it, if the studies adjust for it, that's the yes, or if they don't, there's still an increased risk of oxidized LDL. Now, LDL-C adjustment is not a perfect adjustment. Really, what would be most beneficial is to look at LDL-P. So that's a far more direct adjustment, while LDL-C is an imperfect adjustment. And I, I have videos, uh, or I have other study analyses that discuss that, um, that distinction, so I won't go back into it. But just know that it's an imperfect adjustment, but it's still important to have it. It's still important to see. And then they look at uh, the how oxidized LDL are measured. So the amounts, so they're basically split into these different categories of low, medium, high, or is it just high versus low and things of that nature. And it doesn't really matter. Again, all the studies end up showing that there's an increased risk. So across the board, no matter the subgroup analysis, there's always an increased risk with uh, with the oxidized LDL uh, to heart disease. Okay, the next analysis is to look at study 187. And I really like this analysis uh, because I'm sure it took a lot of work uh, and it tells us some granularity that the previous analysis was not able to offer to us. So the way they did this, and I guess I'll go back real quick. This study 187 is public funding. Again, it's all listed in the notes. So if you want more details on all that, uh, you can have access to that. So this is how they did it. They recruited uh, 1,324 individuals, and then they ended up accepting 1,116 individuals. So uh, some people they ended up eliminating because they had cardiovascular disease at baseline, and some people they didn't have the blood sample uh, storage, so they couldn't they couldn't actually access the data. Uh, then they had people return. So this is in 2002, they were recruited in this study and then they returned in 2012. So 10 years later, they were, and you can see that there's a pretty big drop off, right? There's 1,116 individuals that uh, were in the study at the beginning, then 10 years later, only 804 returned to the lab to, to have their test data or the data to be collected. So you see a drop off, but still a sample size of 804 is quite large. It may not be enough, actually. It depends on, it depends on a number of factors that I won't go into. But then they separated out by uh, without 10-year carotid plaque progression, so 300 individuals, and with 10-year carotid plaque pr progression, which was 504 individuals. So at this point, we are not talking about LDL. There's, you know, we're not talking about anything related to that. This is just purely how they separated out people, how many people they had, when they started the study, and when they ended the study. That's it. Okay, so let's look at the baseline values. So the way they're breaking this up, so this is baseline characteristics. This is at in 2002. This is the, the data from 2002. And they have broken up the amounts of oxidized LDL that were detected in the blood by low levels in tertile one, moderate levels in tertile two, and high levels in tertile, two, in tertile three. That's gonna be a mouthful, tertile. And then they've got, we wanna make sure that these are as similar as possible wherever we can get that similarity. Now, unfortunately, we're not going to get that uh, similarity across the board, because usually people with high levels of oxidized LDL tend to also have some other issues as well, which I realize is often the critique of 
looking at LDL, but there are some really strong statistical methods that we can use to adjust for some of these differences, and we'll be getting into some of those. So at the beginning, the age was roughly the same. It was about maybe a year different, and we can see the statistical significance actually starts to approach statistically significant, but it's only about a two-year difference between these conditions. Uh, male, again, they, they, it's about the same. So about 42% male, obviously the rest were female. Uh, current smokers, you can see a lot of these different uh, areas that there were uh, possibly some significant differences like BMI. So these individuals were on the cusp of being overweight. These people were slightly overweight. The statistical significance is quite close. When you're looking at statistical significance, you're looking for a cutoff point of 0.05 is the cutoff point for statistical significance for most studies. Now, there's a lot of nuance that gets applied to that. So anybody that, you know, has as a rebuttal to that, I, you know, there's, there's things that I can't get into. Otherwise it just derails the conversation. Uh, type two diabetes, we've got more people in the oxidized LDL uh, condition compared to the lower level, but the moderate level tend to, tended to be uh, the lowest level, the lowest number of people with uh, type two diabetes. We're talking about a percentage there. Uh, fasting blood glucose levels, so they were higher in the oxidized LDL condition. You know, you can just walk all the way down. All of these are statistically significant, so all of them are different from one another. So LDL cholesterol is also much higher in the tertile 3, and this is in millimole per liter. So we're talking well above the normal reference range. And this is still in the, you know, still relatively okay, maybe a little bit elevated as well, but still relatively okay. So this is a potential conf a huge confounding factor unless they end up addressing that in the covariate analysis, uh, analyses that they, that they will end up doing, uh, as you'll see. Now, the other aspect to look at is to look at the particle number. I really love the fact that they did this. This is such a good, this is a nice touch, and this is the difference that I was talking about between LDL cholesterol. So looking at the cholesterol levels, you're actually measuring the esters, the actual cholesterol molecules, as opposed to looking at the particle number. And in this situation, they're looking at the particle number, and they're also separating it out by the size of the particle. So they're looking at large, buoyant, and the small, dense LDL. So again, uh, we're looking at some differences there and LDL particle size as well. So there are, and then obviously, let's just, as the last one, let's look at, and you can read obviously all of these for yourself, but the oxidized LDL levels were obviously higher for tertile three because, well, that's the definition of tertile three. You're supposed to have higher uh, oxidized LDL and this is supposed to be moderate and this is supposed to be uh, uh, lower. So clearly you're getting a stepwise increase 32 to 47 to 64 so that's all good that you know this information is good it's helpful but there are a lot of initial differences so it's it, you know you're going to need some powerful statistical tests to be able to start to to adjust the 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 measurements for these all these different covariates that are also implicated or also change with this high level of oxidized LDL. So let's start to look at that. Right now, in this analysis, so the same study, we're just looking at the basic relationship to increased oxidized LDL or to, to, in, to oxidized LDL as a whole. So total cholesterol is higher has a direct relationship. So you see an increase. So you have high levels of total cholesterol and you have high levels of oxidized LDL. LDL cholesterol, you have a, um, a pretty strong relationship there as well, where LDL cholesterol is also tightly related with oxidized LDL. HDL cholesterol is inversely related. It's a weak association, but there's an inverse relationship with HDL cholesterol. So that's really interesting non-HDL cholesterol. So this is even more telling than I think than total cholesterol. And here we're, we're starting to look at the values of LDL cholesterol, IDL cholesterol, these other types of uh, ApoB containing uh, particles. And we're seeing that there is a, an association, a direct association, a positive association between oxidized LDL and high levels and 
I should just say non-HDL cholesterol. Triglycerides, it's a weaker association, but it is still present there as well. Uh, lipoprotein A, a weak association, but still present. And then this is what I was really uh, interested in is the LDL particle number. So for the, let's say for the large, for example, there's no association with oxidized LDL. This small, however, the small dense LDL, there is an association. So the higher the, or the, the greater amounts of small LDL are associated with the, with oxidized LDL. And there's an inverse relationship with particle size. So as particle size increases, you have uh, lower levels of oxidized LDL, which corroborates this data as well. Now, the association isn't that strong, but still, it's, uh, it's still there. It is, and it is statistically significant. So this is without any of the adjustments that I was talking about earlier. And then again, we're talking about no adjustments, but now we're actually looking at the amount of carotid plaque. So this, to be 100% clear, this could be confounded by any number of different things. This could be confounded by the fact that the third tertile had higher diabetes levels. It could be that they had higher just total LDL levels. It could be that they had higher triglyceride levels, whatever. The point is that there are a number of different, there's many different factors that could be the real reason for this progression in carotid plaque. So just to be clear at this point, we have the lowest levels of oxidized LDL, we have the moderate levels of oxidized LDL, and the highest levels of oxidized LDL, and we're looking at the 10-year progression of carotid plaque. So in the lowest level, we have the lowest level of progression of carotid plaque. In the moderate, we have uh, statistical significance comparing these two, and we do see an increased level of carotid plaque. And then when we look at the highest level, it is not statistically significant versus the moderate, but it is statistically significant versus the lowest level of oxidized LDL. Again, it could be some other factor though that's leading to this uh, overall change. Remember that if I go back here, for example, the body mass index was a little bit higher in the tertile three, so that may be the explanation or you had more people with hypertension, maybe that's the explanation. Or if you were to look at triglycerides, they were higher in the tertile three, maybe that's the explanation. The point is that it's, diff it's impossible to tease out unless you start getting into these uh, multivariate analyses. And that's what we begin doing right now. Okay, so now we're looking at three different models and for these models they're adjusting for all of these different factors so models one and two they're adjusting for every single one of these factors so age sex current smoking diabetes blood pressure cr uh, c reactive protein antihypertensive drugs triglycerides hdl cholesterol and statins so that's controlled in these two and then model three has all of them except for triglycerides so now they're stratifying it based off of, they have all this data from all these individuals and now they're able to, to segment everyone, the data, the pools of data, according to uh, after having adjusted for the, the relationship that each one of these has to uh, the plaque formation. And now they're able to look at low ox, let's just take this one example, low oxidized LDL and low LDL cholesterol. So both of them at the same time, that is our reference. So that is what everything is going to be compared against. So is there an increased risk? The, the only way to know that is if we see numbers higher than one. And they have to be statistically significant, showing that there's a certain level of certainty in those results. So that's, Across the board, that is our reference. Low oxidized LDL, low LDL cholesterol. That is our best possible scenario. Now, what if we start changing each one of these variables? That's the question that we have. So high oxidized LDL, but still low overall LDL cholesterol, we see that there's a slight increase in risk and it is statistically significant. So this would indicate that, high, that oxidized LDL independent of LDL cholesterol, and remember, they're not looking at the particle number, that's actually in the next section, that we see that risk. Then low oxidized LDL and high 
LDL cholesterol, we see that there is still this increased risk. So it's not necessarily dependent, at least by this interpretation, by this data set, that the association is not dependent on oxidized LDL. And it can occur still when you just have high LDL cholesterol levels, high oxidized LDL versus high LDL cholesterol. So the combination of the two also increases risk, but it doesn't seem to increase it more. So that's really interesting. But again, this is an imperfect measure. Remember, LDL cholesterol as a whole is an imperfect measure. And again, I would recommend that you go over to my other analysis, uh, my other detailed study analysis, uh, which goes into explaining why that is. Okay, model two. Now, the only difference here is that they're looking at particle number. Instead of cholesterol, which I've told you, I like particle number far more than I do cholesterol. So here again, we've got a reference, low oxidized LDL versus the, the low total LDL particle number. That's our reference. So high oxidized LDL, but low particle number. So the, the fewer number of the actual lipoproteins, then there's still a slightly increased level of risk. Now, when we look at low oxidized LDL and high total LDL particles, we see that the risk is potentially still high. It's approaching statistical significance, but it's actually not statistically significant. That may be because they didn't have enough data uh, points to actually be sufficient to generate to have statistical significance, or it's possible that this is just a real effect. And but my money would be on there's an increased risk, but it's not nearly as increased or it's not as increased as when you have both of them. So when you have high oxidized LDL plus high total LDL particle number, then you see the statistical significance and you see an increased risk across the board. So that's really intriguing in its own right as well. And then model three is looking at the other variable that changes is small LDL particle number. So now they're looking at not just the total particle number, but they're looking at the small dense LDL particle number. And with the high oxidized levels, but the low small dense levels, we see it still approaches statistical significance that it is still, there is still an increased risk. Now when there's a low oxidized LDL and high levels of these small LDL particles, there's no risk. There's no risk. So that's really intriguing. Now, I wonder if that's because these individuals, all, because they don't actually adjust for this, that's because these individuals may have uh, higher levels of the, or may have just, I'm sorry, they have lower levels. They have low levels of total LDL particle number. So yes, they may have sm uh, lower or high levels of the small LDL particles, but they may have low levels of the overall LDL particle numbers, which the small LDL particles fits into that category. So the, the small LDL particle numbers may be high, but the large buoyant LDL particles may be really low, which offsets uh, that, that difference. So we don't actually know. That's just a pure speculation on my part. I'm not saying that that is the case. I'm saying that that is a potential explanation as to why we see the loss of the risk there. And then a high, and then the final one is high oxidized LDL and high small LDL particle number. We see that it is, uh, again, we see that reintroduction of uh, increased risk. Okay, and then the final one on here, they have a few other analyses, but these are the main ones that I wanted to cover. Uh, mainly because the other ones are largely repetitive or just kind of iterative steps to essentially get to these final panels of data, which is what I'm showing you here. So here we're looking at different subgroups. And I thought I'd report this just because it's interesting that with the, each one of these subgroups of so subgroup one all the way across, subgroup two all the way across, and subgroup three, three all the way across, they have these different uh, exclusions. So they are excluding particular data sets to see if, if they exclude that data set, do they still see an effect or do they see a loss of an effect in the risk to uh, plaque formation and ca generally cardiovascular disease. So subgroup one, they've excluded those with cardiovascular events in the past 10 years. 
Subgroup two, they're excluding the statin users. So that's a very important one. And sub, subgroup three is those with carotid plaque at baseline. So at the baseline, when they were measured, they already had some carotid plaque and they ended up still being part of the, the study. Now, oxidized LDL tertiles, again, were at T1, T2, and T3. Again, T3 is the highest, T1 is the lowest, and that is our reference range across the board. So the best possible scenario is the uh, reference range, and then everything is compared against that. And when we look at, let's say, the highest levels in subgroup 1, 2, and 3, regardless of the exclusion criteria, we still see increased risk across the board. Now... Now getting into oxidized LDL levels and LDL cholesterol levels. Remember, these are all the same analyses that we just went over here, but we're not getting these adjustments here. So just to be clear, as far as uh, I, could, I could tell. And here we're just to look at this generally and without belaboring the point, you can read this uh, for yourself at this point. We see that uh, with high oxidized LDL and high LDL cholesterol, we see risk is increased across the board. In people, when you exclude the statin users, then we see also increased risk across the board. And in subgroup three, however, uh, this one, maybe this approach is significant. We don't actually know the statistics here, but at 1.17 for subgroup two, we see that looking at the small LDL particle number in both the high levels for high oxidized and high small LDL particles, we see that there's increased risk for these two subgroups. So subgroup one and two, but not for three. And that's possible, possibly because they don't have enough data for the granularity or because of this effect that I mentioned earlier that even though you have high small LDL particle number, that may not actually feed into actually having high total LDL particle number. So there's a few possibilities there. But ultimately, what we do know is that for two of the conditions, there is still this increased risk. So this was, to me, this was a really fascinating uh, investigation. You got to think that's, that's 10 years worth of data that you're going over and, or, you know, from two different endpoints, baseline versus uh, the, the endpoint at 10 years. And it's really telling. Uh, and again, I acknowledge this is association, but again, they're, they're doing some really powerful uh, statistical adjustments to, to tease out, uh, you know, the diabetes risk, like remove that diabetes risk and see if there's still an effect, uh, to remove the hypertension risk, see if there's an effect, the triglycerides, to see if there's an effect. So uh, really, really powerful stuff. Okay, uh, the final analysis that I wanted to go over here is study 186, which is also publicly funded. And then we're going to get into reducing the oxidized LDL. So how, it, you know, if we take vitamin E, can we reduce uh, oxidized LDL? And for, for this one, uh, again, we're looking at baseline values. So they've got uh, 2,060 individuals, and this is, again, another uh, associative study. And we're looking for baseline values between people with coronary heart disease. So the number of in individuals with that had a case of coronary heart disease versus non-coronary heart disease. And we're not ultimately going to be that interested in the comparison between the two because they end up mixing the data together. I think they do some other uh, data. They end up showing some other data where they separate the two, uh, but it was some kind of peripheral measures, if I remember correctly. And what we're going to be doing is combining the two. So ultimately, it doesn't really matter that much about the differences between the two because even though there are some differences like age, for example, uh, smoking status, uh, frequency of exercise, body mass index, all these different uh, measures are different. Inflammatory markers, if you're looking at uh, ICAM, E-selectins, obviously oxidized LDL is, uh, also seems to be lower in the non-coronary heart disease individuals as well. So there's a number of different uh, differences. But again, they're going to be doing these uh, adjustments these statistical adjustments to try to tease out some of these differences. Okay, so here are the adjustments. And again, they're, they're combining the two. So we're not getting that separation between the two groups. And I'm going to be reporting on this 
half of the analysis. I could go over this half of the analysis. I did end up reading on the AUC, AUC with uh, oxida uh, oxidized LDL, the IDI and the NRI. These are different measures of what we're gonna be going over here. I'm not that familiar, just full disclosure, I'm not that familiar as of yet in these two measures. But from my reading, uh, it seems like they are alternative ways of looking at this data. So I'm just gonna be focused on what I understand better than uh, the two measures that I don't understand as well. If you are an epidemiologist and you would like to jump in, I would be humbled and I would love to, to hear from you. Uh, maybe you can educate me on this topic of IDI and NRI. But as it stands, just so you know, full disclosure, that's why I'm not going to be touching on, on this. It's not because I'm trying to hide anything. It's, well, I'm literally hiding my ignorance, <laughs> if you want to put it that way. So let's focus on the things that I'm less ignorant in. Okay, so here again, they're breaking things down by T1, T2, T3. Guess what that means? T1 is the lowest level of oxidized LDL, T2 is moderate, and T3 is the highest level of oxidized LDL. And here we've got our P, uh, uh, significance or p-value for significance, again, set to 0.05. For anything under that is statistically significant. So these are all set to one because these are the reference values, and then all these are compared against the reference values. And here we've got the different models. So again, these are adjustments for sex, age, and data for the type of database that they ended up getting these values from. So they used a number of different databases to get uh, the, the 2,060 individuals involved in this study. And they end up trying to see, okay, well, what if we focus on just the data from uh, one database or just the data from two databases? Or what if we do look at the data from each database individually and see if it changes uh, the results that we see. So they end up controlling for that. Uh, model two is the same one, but it also includes blood pressure, physical activity levels, diabetes, weight, family history of myocardial infarction, so that's heart attack, and alcohol. Now remember, all of these factors are things that were actually different uh, between the two groups uh, when, we, when we get into this area. So body mass index, for example, is different. Uh, waist to hip ratio is different. Uh, history of MI is also different. So that's why they're trying to use these statistical methods to try to tease out those uh, so that they're less of a factor on the overall analysis. So to look at oxidized LDL. The other one is, so model three is model one. So, but not including, to be clear, not including model two. And it includes, however, total cholesterol divided by HDLC ratio. Model four is looking at model one. So sex, age, and database, plus C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, ICAM and E-selectins, which are all measures, are all uh, proponents of uh, immune function or inflammation. And finally, model five is a combination of all of them combined. So that's adjusting for all the different factors all at once. Okay, so now that we're clear on that, we can see that across the board, if you have a moderate level of oxidized LDL, which we don't actually know what the cutoff for this moderate level is, but the moderate level, we see that there is, I would argue, even though the, the p-value is not actually indicating differences between T1 and T2, it's actually just looking for overall changes from T1, T2, then to T3. So it's looking for a trend across, across levels of oxidized LDL. So we don't have the granularity, statistically speaking, to say, oh, this 1.18 is statistically significant. All we can really say with great confidence is that the highest level is statistically significant versus uh, T1. So 2.3, that's a huge increase. It's 130% increase in risk over uh, the standard, which is the uh, T1, the low oxidized uh, LDL levels. And that's the, that's the case across the board. We see statistical significance across the board, regardless of the model that you're looking at. However, for the moderate levels, you don't really see that. So I would argue that none of these are probably statistically significant, that there's no increased risk. However, when you get in the higher levels, even this one, which is 
it's 1.29 is the effect size. So that's a 29% increase. If you adjust for every single one of these factors in combination, you still approach statistical significance with the increased, the high levels of oxidized LDL. So one of the drawbacks of this analysis, however, is that they don't control for LDLC. So total LDLC or LDL particles, which would have been uh, even more preferable. So that's unfortunate. Hey, real quick, before we continue on, I'm curious if you'd be interested in actually learning how to reduce your oxidized LDL, or if you'd like to learn about some other markers that may also be and maybe even better markers for cardiovascular disease than oxidized LDL, as well as having access to seminars by me, live sessions with me, a journal club, uh, being able to access some written reviews and have summaries of all of my deep dives. Uh, as well as plenty of other benefits. Well, if that sounds good to you, then uh, I would certainly welcome you to join the Physionic Insiders, which is a program that's exclusive. You get my attention. I follow you. So anytime you post, then uh, I'm alerted to that. And then I try to answer your questions as soon as I can. So if you're interested in having a more personalized experience and having access to my full unabridged content, as well as much of the exclusive content or all of the exclusive content, then I would say you should join. Anyway, I'll add a link to it. And without further ado, let's get back to the public analysis. All right. So at this point, we know that we, we have a pretty good sense that oxidized LDL seems to have an impact on heart disease risk. Now, if that's independent of anything else, some analyses would indicate that yes, uh, but that doesn't actually mean that it is the only factor or that uh, non-oxidized LDL is not a factor. And we saw that in some of the analyses as well. So we still see oxidized LDL may be a independent risk factor, but LDL, even when it's not oxidized, may also be a factor. So how do we actually focus on the oxidized LDL? How do we reduce the oxidized LDL? And does it potentially have an effect on heart disease? So we're going to be focused on this study, which is uh, a, a beast of a study. I can see why they ended up uh, um, getting it in circulation, which is a really, really uh, popular, or I guess I should say prestigious journal when it comes to heart disease uh, research. And this is the vitamin E atherosclerosis prevention study. So VIPS and it is study 184 and it is partially industry funded. So if you wanna know what industry uh, and the other half of it is uh, publicly funded. So if you're interested in details, again, you can check it out uh, in the notes. So how did they do this? This is really cool in that it is a uh, randomized controlled trial. So unlike all the other studies that were associative, this was is a randomized controlled trial where they pre-screened uh, 1,833 individuals. They ended up uh, screening at the clinic 993. Then 640 were ineligible. So they randomized 353 individuals. So they put 176 in the placebo group and they put 177 in the, the vitamin E group. The, vit the placebo group is essentially a fake treatment. So they don't, it's uh, almost identical to the vitamin E in every way, except it doesn't have vitamin E. Then they, they ended up uh, doing tests at the baseline, and then they took tests again at the two-year mark, and then they decided the IRB, so the Internal Review Board, ended up talking to them and saying, well, hey, you're already going through all this effort. You might as well do another endpoint at three years because it's possible that you're not going to have enough granularity if you just do it after two years. Remember, atherosclerosis is a, is a condition that occurs over decades. It occurs over many years, and it really depends on the level of all the risk factors, not just LDL, but just in general, smoking, uh, blood pressure, all that stuff, weight, all that stuff has an effect. So if you have really, if you have horrible habits in all of those for like 20 years, your risk is huge. But if you've only been doing it for one year, then the risk may, like it's certainly elevated, but you, you may not actually be able to detect that much. So they end up extending it to three years. So they do a two-year analysis and a three-year analysis. And they end up with 170 individuals at the end. 
in the placebo and 162 in the vitamin E supplemented group. Okay, so these are the baseline values. Again, uh, we're looking at the p-value here to compare the what they consider the evaluable placebo versus the evaluable uh, vitamin E. And then they've, and the reason why they've got some people that are inevaluable is because not everybody ended up continuing the, the study. So I'm going to be focused on this over here because this is uh, here. They're just trying to see, well, if the people that they lost uh, at the three year mark from the two year mark, is that going to make some sort of a difference? So I'm going to be focused on this half of the data. And here they're looking, the measure is carotid uh, IMT, so uh, intimal thickness. So that's that region that I was talking about that starts to increase in size as you build up a lot more LDL in that region and cholesterol crystals and the whole mess that I described in the mechanism section. And what we see is that at the beginning, at baseline, there were no significant differences across the board, except look at this, the LDL cholesterol, the total LDL cholesterol, not oxidized, but total LDL cholesterol was probably higher in the vitamin E condition at baseline. This is a huge bummer. It is a huge bummer. And it is a uh, huge potential confounding factor to this study. I know it's not statistically significant, but it is so close. Uh, and the researchers end up acknowledging that in, uh, in their, their discussion section of, of this paper. So that's one factor that's unfortunate, but the rest of it uh, looks all uh, statistically the same or unlikely to be different. I guess I should say it that way. Okay, so these are the results. And just as a quick aside, because they don't actually show data, they just report it, they just write it out. Uh, they say that the vitamin E supplementation did reduce the oxidized LDL by 20%. So the vitamin E did have an effect on oxidized LDL, but then the next question is, does it have an effect on intimal thickness? Does it reduce intimal thickness or the reduce the progression of intimal thickness? So here we are with... Uh, the progression rate. So we've got all the individuals, the placebo versus the vitamin E, and we see that it is statistically not significant. It kind of approaches statistical significance, but it's actually not in favor of vitamin E. But the way to interpret this would be that there's no uh, effects. So, and this is adjusted for baseline LDL. So here they're doing the adjustment because remember these values were a little bit higher in the uh, vitamin E condition. And once they adjust for that, statistically speaking, they, they uh, try to eliminate that covariate. There, the statistical significance kind of increases or the, the lack of statistical significance uh, adjusts upwards. So that furthers this gap. And, but again, the way to interpret this would be that vitamin E supplementa supplementation did not have an effect on uh, intimal thickness progression, unfortunately. And then they look at a number of different other metrics so like the uh, sex of the individuals, uh, the plasma vitamin E levels, the plasma vitamin C levels, none of those are different. Uh, and lipid levels, so total cholesterol. So total cholesterol was higher in the vitamin E condition. So this is another confounding variable, unfortunately. And they don't end up doing an adjustment for that. Uh, LDL cholesterol at the end of the study was uh, roughly not different. So that's interesting. But total cholesterol was higher in the vitamin E condition. So did they potentially have higher uh, IDL levels or VLDL levels? That's a possibility uh, to account for this total cholesterol. Uh, HDL cholesterol, no differences. Total triglycerides, no differences. And then you can look at some of these uh, other metrics as well. So none of these were uh, significantly different. So the conclusion from this is that vitamin E supplementation does reduce oxidized LDL, but unfortunately, it does not uh, reduce the progression rate of atherosclerosis uh, in these individuals. And but unfortunately, we can't 
make too, too many conclusions other than vitamin E does reduce oxidized LDL. And the reason why is because there are too many confounding factors. So one was the baseline LDL, but if you do some statistical adjustments and you find that there's no real effect, uh, but the other problem is that their total cholesterol was also different and it was higher in the vitamin E condition. So that's a potential confounding, or it is a confounding variable. So that's, that's really unfortunate. But the thing we definitely can say is that vitamin E supplementation reduces oxidized LDL by 20%. So supplementation does reduce the oxidized levels. So there are a number of different explanations. So one thing that the researchers pointed out is that the placebo group also saw slight increases in vitamin E, unfortunately, which is really funny uh, because you don't want to see that. So, but they did see a slight increase, but it was still much more of an increase in the vitamin E supplementation group. Uh, the other thing is that vitamin E supplementation can sometimes reduce the antioxidants, the other antioxidants like coenzyme. Uh, coenzyme Q, I believe, or uh, ubiquinol was one of the, the antioxidants that can reduce when you supplement with too much vitamin E. And the other thing is that vitamin E itself can be an oxidant if it's consumed in too high of levels. So there are a number of considerations. The reason why I would dismiss those concerns is that vitamin E supplementation was shown to reduce oxidized LDL. Now, one other critique that the researchers actually bring up is the fact that even though the vitamin E supplementation reduced the oxidized LDL, they, it was actually the, it was an, uh, an out of body assay. So they take the LDL and then measure the, the oxidizability of that LDL. And they're saying that it's possible that the blood values don't correspond to what's found in the intima itself. So you know, that's, they, they ended up citing, I believe, some studies that did show that there's this relationship between the two, but that's a possible other factor for why we don't see uh, results. So a little inconclusive, but the one thing we can definitely say is that vitamin C E supplementation did reduce uh, oxidized LDL, at least in the blood. Okay, so the midpoint conclusions before we move on, if you're uh, one of the insiders uh, and you're part of my insiders program, you get access to uh, the full version of this. So you'll get access to other molecules that actually lower oxidized LDL. I think I have like six more uh, to, that I cover. And then also, and it's just like a quick list format. And then the a better target than oxidized LDL that's starting to, to come to light. So oxidized LDL is a, is a good marker, but there may be a better marker of than uh, oxidized LDL. And I also explain why that marker may be a slightly better. So if you're interested, then join the Physionic Insiders. That said, for the midpoint conclusion, oxidized LDL is a risk factor for the progression of cardiovascular disease. It seems like that's relatively clear. It may even be an independent risk factor separate from LDL amount and cholesterol content based off of that one analysis that had all those multivariate analyses involved. Uh, oxidized LDL facilitates, and just to be clear here, it's also likely that LDL independent of oxidation also is a risk factor. So it's not saying that oxidized LDL is the only thing to worry about. It's just a, a potentially a major thing to worry about, but it's not the only thing. Uh, oxidized LDL facilitates the formation of foam cells. So that's those immune cells that take up all that oxidized LDL. Then uh, you have these crystals that form inside the foam cells and they end up, end up undergoing uh, necrosis or cell death. Under and that all occurs under the endothelial cells, under the endothelial layer, uh, along with the proteoglycans, which contributes to cell death and the release of cholesterol crystals, which end up getting taken up by other immune cells, and then the cycle repeats itself. Additionally, it facilitates many changes in the smooth muscles. So remember that migration that I briefly touched on that I didn't go into too much detail, but the smooth muscles can also upregulate their oxidase levels, which ultimately lead to greater oxidation of the LDL particles. The leukocytes, which is the immune cells that I was talking about, and the endothelial cell behavior that causes the initial stages of atherosclerosis. So that's where I'm stopping it here. Uh, if you're interested, uh, 
uh, in continuing, then, as I said, join the Physionic Insiders. And if not, look, I hope that you got a lot out of this. Uh, this, this investigation itself, these six studies, uh, took a lot of work. It was, you know, a good, uh, I'd say, maybe month, month and a half or, or, or so of work. But uh, I think hopefully we're, we've gotten some answers. We've gotten some answers about oxidized LDL and at least one way to reduce oxidized LDL, although that study wasn't that great, so we, we couldn't uh, fully tell if that was actually gonna have an effect on uh, atherosclerosis risk. So I hope you got something out of this, and especially the mechanisms, which I find absolutely fascinating and make me all geeky and excited, and I'll hope to have the pleasure of speaking with you in the near future. Have a good one, bye.